Good evening. Good evening and welcome here to Westminster College and this wonderful hallowed space of St. Mary the Virgin Aldermanbury uh, atop America's National Church and Museum. My name is Tim Riley uh, and I'm very, very happy all of you are here with us this evening as we welcome another legendary lecturer uh, to this campus to share with us insights uh, on free trade. To open this evening's presentation, I'd like to invite to the lectern, um, Reverend Kiva Nice Webb. Kiva. We gather together today to contemplate the challenges and opportunities of leadership. We gather bringing with us various images of leadership, leaders of nations like Abraham Lincoln and Winston Churchill, leaders of communities like Gandhi and Rosa Parks, leaders whose names have been lost to history but who worked in their own quiet way toward the common good. Though different in scope and story, all leaders have in common a sense of calling. Some are called by God, as Jesus was, to whom this magnificent space is dedicated. And all are called to live and lead according to their deepest values, their personal strengths, and within particular communities and contexts. As we enter into this time of contemplating the challenges and the opportunities of leadership, let us each take a moment of silence to give thanks for our own sense of calling, for our own source of values, our own strengths and weaknesses, and the communities and contexts within which we are called to lead. We give thanks in honor of our best values and in the name of our deepest sources of calling. Amen. May I ask you please to rise for the playing of the national anthems of Australia and the United States. And now I'd like to welcome to the lectern uh, our own Sarah Manley. Sarah. Good evening, and thank you all so much for being here. My name is Sarah Manley. I'm a senior here at Westminster College. 
I'm a self-designed major in integrated marketing communications with business management with a minor in leadership and a certificate in nonprofit management. To me, leadership means stepping out of the ordinary and guiding others to be nothing but extraordinary. When picking a school, I knew I wanted to attend a college or university where I had the opportunity to thrive in leadership roles, but where I could also go Greek. I'm a member of the sorority Cap Alpha Theta, where I currently serve as our chief recruitment officer and formerly served as our special events chair and chief panelitic officer. Theta has given my sisters and I numerous leadership and service opportunities. I am also a member of Student Foundation, where I give campus tours to potential new students. And lastly, I was a member of the Churchill Singers for the past three years. My Westminster experience has been nothing short of transformative. Most recently, however, I have been putting all of my efforts into the, into the organization, excuse me, into the origination of the college's first ever student marketing agency, West Wings. Serving as the president of West Wings has easily been one of the most impactful and unforgettable experiences I have had in all of my four years at Westminster College. With the help of the college's marketing department, myself and four other students have worked diligently to form and perfect the agency. I have loved leading my peers in various projects, getting to learn how to manage a business's social media accounts, create student and faculty profile stories, work on the school's website, create radio and television ads and commercials, etc. It has been so rewarding to receive real-world work experience while developing lasting friendships at the same time. This has truly been a leadership experience like no other, and to me, speaks volumes about the leadership opportunities and potential here at Westminster College. I have always considered myself a leader, but at Westminster, I was able to really find myself by diving headfirst into numerous leadership positions. Westminster truly paves the way for students' futures, success, and molds leaders daily. Through my many leadership roles and involvement on campus, I have found myself and I have found my purpose. At Westminster, I am not just a needle in a haystack. I am Sarah Manley from Kirkwood, Missouri, majoring in business. Westminster has shaped the person and leader I am today, which will forever be one of my largest blessings. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome this year's annual Cherry Price Lecture, a lecture on leadership made possible through contributions by alumni Rob Price and Howard Cherry. We have many exciting events and initiatives taking place at Westminster this year, including the 50th anniversary celebration of the Churchill Museum, the Digital Blue Smart Technology Program designed to prepare our iPad-equipped students for the digital demands of the professional world, and Westminster Women Advancing Together, an exciting new initiative that coincides with our celebration of 40 years of women at Westminster College, and whose goal is to encourage more women to enroll at Westminster College. And I hope they all turn out like Sarah Manley, who's one of the great leaders of the future, uh, who will graduate shortly. Tonight's lecture falls on the heels, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> of the recent John Finley Green Lecture delivered by Dr. Madeleine Albright, the first U.S. woman Secretary of State. And so tonight's lecture continues the manifestation of significant and exciting events on our campus this year. And our speaker this evening is the Honorable Joe Hockey, Ambassador from Australia, who will speak to us on the sinews of prosperity in defense of free trade. The Honorable Joe Hockey is Australia's ambassador to the United States of America, taking up his posting in Washington in January 2016. Mr. Hockey has had a long and distinguished career as a leader in public service. He first entered Parliament in 1996 as the member for North Sydney and spent more than 17 years on the front bench. Mr. Hockey served as a minister in a number of different portfolios, including financial services, small business and tourism, human services, and employment and uh, workplace relations. In 2013, Mr. Hockey was appointed Treasurer of the Commonwealth and was responsible for all economic policy, including fiscal policy. He served as chair of the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors in 2014 and as a member of the leadership Troika in 2015. As treasurer, he was a regular delegate 
to IMF, World Bank, Asian Development Bank, and APEC meetings. Previously, Mr. Hockey served as a banking and finance lawyer with a major Australian law firm. He graduated from the University of Sydney with bachelor's degrees in arts and law. Mr. Hockey is married to Ms. Melissa Babbage, a company director and former investment banker. They have three young children, Xavier, Adelaide, and Ignatius. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm Westminster welcome for Ambassador Joe Hockey. Well, thank you so much for the generous introduction, Dr. Lampkin. I really appreciate it. You have a magnificent college here, which has played an extraordinary role in modern history. And I'd like to give a particular shout out to Senator Roy Blunt. I know he has pressing duties back in Washington, D.C. tonight, but I, uh, he was the reason why I came. He's an outstanding advocate for his beloved Missouri and he's highly respected around the world. Uh, Senator Blunt is a genuine American patriot, uh, and I consider him to represent the very best of public service, and I thank him, Abby, and his family for what they have done for me here in the United States. You have been as welcoming to me today as you must have been for Winston Churchill on the 5th of March in 1946, when he famously came to this college and, after a generous introduction by President Truman, he delivered a totemic address titled The Sinews of Peace. It was a speech that reflected both Winston's values and the enduring principles held by many members of his extraordinary generation. The Iron Curtain speech, as it became known, was delivered during a troubling time for Churchill. He should have been euphoric and optimistic following the defeat of fascism and his role in saving the Western world. Alas, just a few months earlier, that imperfect system of democracy that Churchill had saved in Britain had thrown the great wartime leader out of office. Freedom can be brutal. The British people feared that Mr Churchill could not deliver the post-war prosperity they needed and they desired. They wanted a new world order and Mr Churchill wasn't going to be part of it. Today I would like to reflect on that new world order. Because I am a diplomat, I will follow the traditions of this address. I'll speak candidly. <laughs> to speak only for myself as one famous speaker at this forum once said. It is self-evident that we are living in anxious and baffling times. It's the term that Churchill used to describe his world 73 years ago right here. A world that was beginning to live an uncertain peace with the darkening clouds of communism on the horizon. At that time, the West set up a new world economic order and the United States led the debate. It began in 1944 at the Mount Washington Hotel in Bretton Woods, a small town in New Hampshire. There, 44 countries signed an agreement that mapped out the destiny of economic policy, particularly monetary policy, current exchange, currency exchange, and trade in the post-war era. It facilitated new trade architecture, like the General Agreement on Tra Tariffs and Trade, known as GATT, which over time evolved to become the World Trade Organisation, with over 160 member countries. The United States was the leader in designing the rules of this truly global trading system that all member countries were expected to comply with. That Bretton Woods Agreement delivered other game-changing global institutions, such as the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, 
both of which are based in Washington, D.C. And by having rules, we gained order and discipline that delivered business and investment certainty. It facilitated trade and prosperity. Combined with its system leadership over the last century, the United States has been the most powerful trading nation on earth. Whilst China recently overtook the US as the world's largest exporter of goods, the US is still the dominant global trader. Today, trade represents close to 30% of the United States economy and one in five jobs rely on trade. When Winston Churchill stood here to deliver his speech, trade represented just 10% of the United States economy. So it's tripled since that time. And whilst global trade continues to grow in goods and services, that growth has been at a slower rate than forecast in recent years. So now, more than ever, the United States should be leading the world in the debate in favour of free and fair trade. The United States, of course, was the leading, leading the charge to deliver the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It walked away from its own leadership. But Australia and Japan stepped up to the plate. The TPP-11, which was meant to be 12 countries, is in place and delivers more and better access to markets for the 11 member countries, all United States allies in the Indo-Pacific region. Similarly, the United States should be knocking on the door of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, another trade agreement, which has been negotiated by 16 countries in the Indo-Pacific region, including China and India but not the United States. And the United States should have joined the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank. The bank was initiated by China, and America and Japan have let themselves down by not joining the initiative that supports new infrastructure right across the Indo-Pacific region. 74 countries have joined, and 26 others are negotiating to join. My signature as Treasurer of Australia was the first signature in the world on the founding document. Ladies and gentlemen, if you abdicate leadership, you rarely get it back. So the US must not allow itself to walk away from its economic leadership in the world. Otherwise, it will pay a very significant price. Its role is crucial because it's American values that matter to the American people and the rest of the world. They're the values that helped us win the Cold War. And they're the values that proved that communism could not pay for itself. The economic engine of socialism was running out of other people's money and disincentivizing innovation. And that's what we all know is the spur for economic improvement. Ladies and gentlemen, free trade represents the very best of those Western values. Most people in our communities want to be in control of their own lives. They desire a free and open society that facilitates the pursuit of happiness and a better quality of life for future generations. The benefits of free trade are complex and dispersed. However, no one argues that it fails to deliver an overall increase in prosperity. Consumers and businesses get to purchase a wider variety of products at a higher quality. They obtain more income from selling goods and services into foreign markets. From a government standpoint, trade is a gift, particularly for small open economies just like Australia. Australian consumers have access to better goods and services than what we can produce in Australia. Buyers and sellers, consumers and producers, they all win because they get what they want. If they didn't win, they wouldn't transact. 
I've heard suggestions, and perhaps you've heard them too, that to win in trade with another country, you need to sell more to them than you can buy from them. That is, you need to have a trade surplus. Well, I disagree. The argument put by protectionists in favour of tariffs and quotas is akin to saying that instead of spending my time working for my employer, I should uh, make my own food and sew my own clothes. Trust me, most of us aren't going to do that. It doesn't make sense, does it? No one in a free market thinks twice about their personal trade deficit with the supermarket or the butcher or the baker. They just want to have more money in their pocket at the end of the day than they started with. Since Adam Smith and his logic of the baker and the butcher, we have accepted in free market economies that the best allocation of resources is generally through individuals specialising in their talents and applying their ability. I don't have time to get up and milk the cow, bake the bread, till the fields, build my house, manufacture transport and so on. Neither do economies. They specialise in what they sell in and trade in surplus with others that specialise in different things. I want my doctor to be the best doctor they can be. I don't expect my doctor to build a house. The same is true for international trade. Australia has a big trade deficit with the United States. We're not complaining. In fact, we celebrate the fact that you have a trading surplus that has increased from $10 billion a year to $29 billion a year since we signed a free trade agreement with the United States 15 years ago. Under the deal, we get access to affordable goods and services that we couldn't get without the United States, including the world's best mining equipment and agricultural equipment. A great deal of the equipment comes from Missouri, by the way, from companies like Emerson Electric. Through free trade, we also have deeper and more meaningful relationships with other countries. It brings nations together, brings differing cultures together. History proves that economic isolationism is a precursor for war. Plentiful trade is a facilitator of peace. Australia has used trade to heal old wounds with Japan. It's used trade as a way to build economic and people-to-people -people partnerships with China. Through tourism, through education, services alone, the interactions between Australia and China are deep and enduring. We also happen to have a trade surplus with China. They currently need our resources, and we can only extract those resources with the help of American equipment and investment. Australia, like the United States, is a rich nation because whatever it doesn't consume, it sells to the rest of the world. And both nations are blessed with plenty. We both have abundant resources and energy. We produce more food than we consume. And those sales help us to deliver to our people the health, education and security services they can afford and desire. We also have amazing innovation that can facilitate a better quality of life for billions of people around the world. Australia has just 26 million people on an island the size of the continental United States. We have an already made consumer class of 340 million people hanging around in and around Sydney. So we have to export. Of course, free trade can be contentious. In my country, it enjoys bipartisan support, but it doesn't stop the critics. They usually come out to argue for special favours for particular industries that other hard-working Australians are expected to pay for. The critics trade on sentimentality and fear rather than hope and opportunity. The sensible middle ground of society understands that when we trade freely with other nations, our nation gets richer. 
Protectionism discourages growth and it rewards mediocrity. Consumers end up paying more for the average rather than less for the best. And to be the best in the world, you need the best inputs in the world. A Boeing 787 Dreamliner assembled in the United States has around 2.3 million parts. Those 2.3 million parts are supplied by over 20,000 different companies in the US and around the globe, including in Australia. More than 150 countries feed into the 787 Dreamliner. And because Boeing planes are manufactured in the United States, those globally sourced inputs support America's manufacturing base. Indeed, 80% of the current orders for Boeing are from international customers. So Boeing's parts imports support Boeing's exports. The United States is the most innovative nation on earth, but like every market leader, it will be beaten if it thinks it can do it all on its own. Sooner or later, the remaining 95% of the world population that lives outside the United States is going to catch up. But as the competition increases, we need firm rules for the system. And those rules must be enforced to protect free and fair trade. Isolating an economy from trade and commerce with other countries is a political tool that should be used very cautiously. If a nation becomes economically isolated, then history proves it can end up accelerating domestic nationalism, fueling outward-facing aggression. If unilateral tariffs and quotas are used to punish bad behaviour, then you need to make sure that the message is getting through to the culprits and that a pathway to rejoin the world economy is crystal clear. President Trump is deploying all the tools he can to get a fairer global trading system for the United States. And I understand the reasons for his frustrations. Let me say Australia supports both free and fair trade. But these types of measures, to be clear, are not sustainable long-term solutions. Through tariffs and quotas, big government becomes bigger. Government controls prices. Government controls access to goods. Let's be really clear. Tariffs are taxes imposed by governments on their own people. Quotas are access limits imposed by governments on their own people. If citizens of other countries don't have the same restrictions, they win. In the 21st century, the consumer demands sovereignty, and consumer sovereignty is powered by the free flow of goods and services around the world. The end game must always be a fair global trading system. Every credible economic analysis proves that getting more free and fair trade across the world lifts prosperity and delivers people out of poverty. And the formula is not complicated. We believe in the importance of markets and setting prices and in the rule of law and proper enforcement of those laws. We believe in the free movement of capital, goods and ideas, as well as rewards based on the effort and ingenuity of hardworking and creative individuals. These are the foundations for a free market. I don't need to say it to you, but the United States is a great trading nation. It has to be, given it is home to less than 5% of the world's population, but it's responsible for 18% of global manufacturing and over 15% of the world economy. You're still the world's largest economy. Your dollar is the world's reserve currency. Your capital markets are the engine room for global commerce. So I find the debate in the United States on free and fair trade rather baffling. Being open to the world made America great in the first place. It will keep you great. It was an American exceptionalism 
that helped make today's consumer sovereign in the marketplace. Ironically, standing up for free trade can feel rather unpopular here in America when measured against elite commentary. However, opinion poll shows that general population support for free trade has actually never been higher. Americans don't want to pay more and end up getting inferior goods and services. And Americans know that free trade is a crucial part of the modern American success story. From the internet to pharmaceuticals to entertainment, American innovation has been shared with the world and by doing so, it has made you richer. Trade, free trade, is a big win for the United States of America. And that win is reflected in many ways. I challenge you this. Go to any country in the world and ask people to name the top 20 or 30 US companies that have had an impact on their lives. They'll respond. Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, Ford, Pfizer, CNN, YouTube, Cargill, General Motors, Disney, Morgan Stanley, FedEx, I didn't even mention Amazon, even Missouri locals like Hallmark and H&R Block. Today, I can say to you, all other countries would fail the same test. Name 20 or 30 French companies or Japanese companies or Chinese companies or Russian companies. The average person, the everyday person in the world couldn't do it. So you see, free trade has given you a global reach and a breadth that other countries simply don't have. The US is the world's largest exporter of services, an area that will dominate future world economic growth. US services exports were worth $830 billion in 2018, more than double the exports of the United Kingdom, which was the second largest exporter of services. And US service providers have transformed and are transforming the world from the way we share moments with our family and friends to the way we use information to be more efficient, to the drugs we use for new diseases when our loved ones are sick. Are sick. And US companies help through their efforts to make us laugh and change the way we shop. This is what makes America great. The US is also the world's second largest exporter of goods, with exports worth well over $1.6 trillion in 2018. America exports approximately the same amount of goods as the combined exports of Japan, South Korea and France combined. Whilst there are important stories about the decline of manufacturing in the United States, this statistic on the size of US manufacturing is worth dwelling on. The US manufactures and exports goods that are worth more, just your exports, are worth more than the entire economy of Mexico, or the entire economy of Spain, or Indonesia, just your exports. But I know every country goes through a level of pain when its manufacturing base changes as a result of new technology, new markets and cost adjustments. And workers naturally want higher wages. Even China, which lost 19 million manufacturing jobs in the late 1990s, now has a push for higher wages that require either new technologies or manufacturing plants are moving, as they are, to neighbours like Vietnam. Governments try and fail to manipulate an outcome that preserves the status quo. Subsidies are often used to bolster inefficient industries for political gain. And of course, governments have a responsibility to do all they can to help industries going through tough events like drought, which we have a terrible drought in Australia at the moment, or trade wars and economic downturn. But subsidies that become permanent undermine free trade. For example, China is the biggest steel producer in the world. In 2016, in response to overcapacity, China closed some of its steel production. In fact, the steel production that China closed down in 2016 was equivalent to the combined steel production 
of all North American steel plants that year. They just closed it down. Of course that created dislocation. And I acknowledge that that came with pain, particularly for the newly unemployed workers. But China's other responses to its own excess production have been disappointing. Even though China consumes most of its own steel production, they have also chosen to sell their heavily discounted steel to other countries. And this has caused global price depression, putting at risk the survival of steel plants and livelihoods of workers in the US Midwest, in Australia and elsewhere. Not because our steel plants are less efficient, but simply because their competition, plants in China, are being unfairly subsidised. Australia currently has anti-dumping and countervailing duties in place against imports of 17 products from China. The countervailing duties are specifically designed to offset the subsidies to Chinese producers. But the current world trade rules on industrial subsidies and state-owned enterprises are not good enough. Just last month, speaking in Chicago to the Council on Global Affairs, the Australian Prime Minister said and I quote, global trade rules are no longer fit for purpose, that the rules are just not comprehensive enough. Some would say it's too hard to change the rules, but new rules shouldn't be seen as impossible. In fact, it's been a trend that they've changed every 10 years for the last 60 years, since 1944 at Bretton Woods. So we need to keep working at improving the system rather than destroying the legacy. Otherwise, the critics win. We'll all be worse off. Too often, the critics get away with blaming trade liberalisation for job losses and plant closures. But we know, and much has been written about this, that most of the job losses have been attributed to the rise of automation and assembly lines. Competition that comes from trade plays a role, especially when foreign competitors get a leg up from production distorting government subsidies but it's not the major cause. By mischaracterising mischaracterizing the problem, we risk being blind to the solution. Unfortunately, defenders of free trade try to justify job losses by pointing to great growth in the services sector. But that ignores the fact that a retrenched factory worker in Ohio may not be qualified to be a computer programmer in Austin, Texas. So there's an overdue debate to be had globally about worker reskilling, particularly in the wake of greater life expectancy. In the meantime, we should not give up on particular industries, nor should we be rusted to a static vision of what a particular industry should look like. Some paint a picture of doom and gloom about US manufacturing and the trajectory it was on before a range of new duties were imposed on certain foreign goods, but in fact, US manufacturing activity has actually steadily increased since World War II. The US now manufactures more than ever before, and it's done this with relatively low levels of tariff protection. And it's done this in spite of, despite the rise of China, Latin America, and Southeast Asia as major manufacturing hubs. The same is true for farming. The, the US is the world's largest exporter of agricultural products. One in five farmers in the United States would be forced off the farm if it wasn't for trade. That number is much higher for some products grown here in Missouri, such as soybeans, with close to 50% of production being exported. Other US farmers in cotton, rice and wheat export up to 70% of what they produce on their farms. Farming is iconic in the United States as it is in Australia. Combined, our farmers are not only the best and most productive in the world, they're also great innovators. A good farmer is also the very best environmentalist in our community. So making a go of the land is part of the makeup of our countries. And nothing better illustrates the benefits of free trade than agriculture. The US and Europe, European Union used to be the largest consumers of agricultural products. That's no longer the case. 21% of all wheat consumed in the world is consumed in China. 30% of all rice 
and half of all the pork in the world is consumed in China. Farmers here in the United States and in Australia have prospered as China's middle class has grown and demand for food has increased. And this will similarly be the case as the economies in India, Indonesia, Vietnam and other parts of Asia start to really grow. And over the next century, the emergence of a massive middle class in Africa will further increase demand for our agricultural products. But today, prices for agricultural products in China are much higher than global benchmarks. And this is due in part to demand, but also because of the market price support programs China runs for certain agricultural commodities. And that inflates prices, spurring production, sucking in imports from the global markets. As I've said before, subsidies don't work over the long term. These programs depress international prices for these commodities over time. Global prices for wheat, rice and corn are now set by Beijing and New Delhi. The Chicago Mercantile Exchange used to be the benchmark price for most agricultural commodities traded on global markets. But now, prices for wheat and rice usually include the reference prices set by the Chinese or Indian governments. The Chinese government also distorts trade in key agricultural commodities through its subsidy program. China spends more on trade distorting subsidies for wheat alone than the United States spends on trade distorting subsidies for all agricultural products combined. The US Farm Bill, once the biggest IRA of agricultural exporters such as Australia, uh, uh, for its trade distorting subsidies has increasingly become a compensation mechanism uh, for decisions taken in Beijing or New Delhi. Don't get me wrong, we don't like the US Farm Bill. The sugar program and a few others are incredibly trade distorting. And we aren't going to stop calling these programs out. Just don't tell my South Florida sugarcane or Minnesota sugar beet friends. However, US trade distorting subsidies for agricultural products pale in comparison to policies being implemented in Beijing, New Delhi or across the European Union. Ladies and gentlemen, there are just two countries in the world that stand up against these challenges. The United States, which took a WTO case against China for its subsidies on wheat, rice and corn, and Australia, which has brought a case against India for its sugar subsidies. Some have suggested just stop trading with those countries that break the rules. But to stop trading with China or India is actually the worst possible response. More trade is actually the most logical response to subsidies. For example, Chinese subsidies keep prices high within China, which means that every bushel of American or Australian wheat sold in China is being subsidised by the Chinese government. If we don't trade with China, those Chinese farmers are going to get the subsidies. And if we do trade, our farmers for the moment get the benefit of higher margins. So whilst uh, we get some benefit, China's subsidies are distorting global prices and creating uncertainty. And we need to encourage China to head in a different direction. Of course, there's a well-worn path. Uh, Europe and the US for a long time pursued similar market price programs before they changed. And thank goodness they did. So ladies and gentlemen, when Winston Churchill declared in this place, I quote, from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. He used powerful symbolism to convey his message. In many ways, free trade has failed to paint the picture of prosperity. How can we compete with Billy Joel, who in 1982 wrote Allentown? song about a steel mill closing in Pennsylvania. And how do you address the visual of an out-of-work mining family or a farmer burying their worthless crop? There are tremendous personal costs associated with all the change the world has faced. And it certainly doesn't help when new age billionaires flaunt their wealth 
the wealth that's been created for new industry that cost other people their jobs. But to win the hearts and minds of our communities, we must never hide the truth. The facts are that we have a better quality of life today than that of our parents. We live longer and we have better quality medicine, better quality education, better quality transportation and better quality communications. We live in a safer world than that which Churchill talked about here in 1946 and we live in a much more prosperous world than he ever saw. There's still much work to be done to improve our environment and of course we've all got to do more to provide more equality of opportunity. But I say to you without any conditioning that without prosperity nothing in this world is achievable and to achieve that prosperity we need more free and fair global trade. Thank you very much. Anything you want. Well, you have to have rules of the game. You have to have rules for the system. And there can be different ways of distorting what we would call free trade. Uh, you know, I think it's free trade to be able to be in Australia and use iPad to purchase goods from Amazon in the United States. But I want to make sure that there is uh, an ethical home where those goods are produced. That uh, there is not a, uh, a you know, child labour involved in the production of goods or, uh, in other cases, services. And Woods was about in 1944, and the US led the way in setting the rules. It's the biggest economy in the world. It should be the leader, and it's very good at leadership. And we don't want the US to step back because we share those same values and we have the same broad ethical environment and paradigm that the United States has in that regard. So I was wondering if you had any like, advice concerning how to maintain free trade with places like China and use a lot of currency manipulation, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think China has manipulated currency. I think there are many countries that manipulate their currencies. It's one of the areas where there is the purest form of trade, currency trading, because a US dollar in one part of the world is exactly the same as a US dollar in another part of the world. And the same with an Australian dollar, or a MIMBY, or anything else. Uh, and of course, we are in a period of incredibly low interest rates. And every time I hear people suggest that the Fed, the Federal Reserve, should decrease interest rates, it's very much about devaluing the US currency. Uh, well, uh, you know, countries have used various means to manipulate their currencies. But the fact is that if you have a currency that is well traded and that is not manipulated. It can be an excellent shock absorber for your economy. And I well remember when the Australian dollar 
to the US dollar is worth just 48 cents during the Asian financial crisis. And Americans flooded Australia on holidays and bought everything Australian because it was so cheap. One US dollar got virtually two Australian dollars. But I also remember during the global financial crisis when the US dollar uh, was just one dollar and the Australian dollar was 106. And Australians came over and started up buying nice real estate in New York. And uh, Australians were flooding the United States, going to Disneyland and Hollywood and a range of other places. But at each point, they were shock absorbers for some of the challenges our own economies faced. So if we manipulate our currencies, at the end of the day, it hurts us. Well, a multitude of countries can have free trade agreements. I mean, it's, it's, it's about negotiating one-on-one. -on -one. Now, there's free trade agreements and then there's free trade agreements. Uh, when I was part of a, elected the second time to government in, uh, in 2013, uh, 30 Australia had trade agreements with just 30 per cent of its trading partners. Today, we have trade agreements with 70 per cent of our trading partners. And it was painful. It was painful negotiating those agreements, because those agreements gave us greater access, greater access to uh, markets that we didn't have full access to. And it also meant that we had to stop subsidising some industries. Some industries, like the motor vehicle industry, were already closing because in Australia they were producing just one million cars uh, and it, it, the market just wasn't big enough. And they had already made decisions that they were going to leave. But we were providing a billion dollar subsidy to car manufacturers that were going to walk away. And we had to stop providing those subsidies. And when we stopped providing those subsidies, South Korea said to us, hey, let's talk about that free trade agreement because we want to export cars to Australia. OK. And we quickly negotiated with South Korea a trade agreement. And then Japan, who we've been negotiating with for years, rang us up and said, hey, you've just done a deal with South Korea. You better do a deal with us. We said, well, we've been waiting for this for ages. And we'd cut a deal with South Korea, uh, with South Korea, then Japan, and then, of course, who called? China. And China said, hey, you've just done a deal with South Korea and you've just done a deal with Japan. What about us? We said, we've been talking to you for 10 years. And they said, no, no, let's do it. And we negotiated a deal with China that gives us access, for example, in key areas. And we were really smart about it. We said, well, what's the biggest challenge facing China? over the next few years, it's the demographic bubble. The one-child policy means that the population is ageing very quickly. And we said, hey, how about this? What about Australia, which is really good at operating hospitals, nursing home, retirement villages? Currently, under your laws, we have to have a joint... They're just not very advanced at the moment. What about if we go in? And they said, hey, we need it, let's do it. So you have great access to our retirement system, which over time is going to be the biggest in the world, obviously. You can do it. But also, I might add, we support the United States in its efforts to ensure that China, uh, and really it's some parts of China only, play fully by the rules in protecting intellectual property, in ensuring there is respect for the rule of law when it comes to trade. They are very, very important. And that's the basis upon which China will be able to pursue greater prosperity if it plays within the rules. Yes, ma'am, just here. So, uh I 
I said, uh, what I was saying was there's a limit. These can't be permanent. From time to time, I mean, previous US governments, for example, have imposed tariffs on Australia. We don't impose any tariffs or quotas on the United States. None and zero. And the good news is you've got a massive trade surplus with us. So if that's the benchmark, you win. But as I said in my speech, without your investment, and the United States is by far the biggest investor in Australia, but China is by far our biggest trading partner. But if you weren't in for example, investing in offshore gas, and ExxonMobil, and uh, ConocoPhillips, and, uh, and Peabody, uh, coal and a range of other companies. If you weren't investing in Australia, we wouldn't be able, we haven't got the money to be able to extract our resources to get them over into Asia. Uh, but we have a rule that we do not impose tariffs and quotas because we need to export. And in many ways, we produce about four times what we consume. So the more we can help to remove barriers around the world, the better. Uh, the decision by the President to improve tariffs and quotas on steel and aluminium as a security measure was his call, uh, but Australia was excluded. And I think we were the only country excluded from those tariffs and quotas by the President of the United States because he knows that he could not have a better trade agreement and a better trade outcome with any country uh, like what he has with Australia. It's a great deal and it's a fair deal because we impose no restrictions on US investment and US trade with Australia. Yes, ma'am. It, it, it is, I think, the big debate of the 21st century. Uh, I know Tom Friedman in one of his latest books was talking about a retraining scheme, reskilling scheme that AT&T had in, in, invested in, in within their own company. I found that quite fascinating because they know that if they don't reskill their workers and help to facilitate that reskilling of workers, uh, then uh, they're going to lose out in the long term. In the US, it's very much company-based. Uh, I feel that there isn't the same uh, uh, training program, apprentice programs in the United States that there are in Australia. And they're very much government-led in Australia um, to try and increase the participation rate and to help workers be more productive. Um, we have the second highest or highest minimum wage in the world. And we haven't had a recession for 28 years. It's the longest period of economic growth in the modern world. And we do it because, in part, we've been blessed with resources. A lot of countries have been blessed with resources. We've blessed, been blessed with a lot of different skills. We undertook a lot of hard reform within Australia, which was very unpopular. From both sides of politics in Australia, it's been very unpopular, but it's been done. The one area where we, you know, we could always do more, and the current government continues to do more, is in reskilling workers and training. And yet, uh, I feel that Australia's system is better than many other countries in the world. Fact is, if you're a bricklayer or a plumber, you're not going to be working until you're 80 or 70. Or if it's really hard manual work as a bricklayer or a builder's labourer or any number of really hard manual jobs, maybe you're not going to get past 50. I mean, your body just can't cope. And yet, there is a very real chance that, you know, by the end of this century, if not by the middle of this century, someone on earth is going to live to 150. 
And that raises a whole lot of issues on how they're going to afford all the extra years they're not working, but more importantly, how are we going to make sure they have a quality of life that allows them to have multiple careers? The students here at Westminster are going to have many different careers over the course of their lives. When I went first into law, that was a great hope in my family that, well, I'd retire as a lawyer in 50 years' time. That was never going to be the case. I think we've got enough lawyers in the world. And I understand this college produces quite a few. Quite a few. That's right. So, right? there you go. So, it, not anything wrong about lawyers. We love lawyers, of course. But I just say this uh, we're all going to have many different careers. And what we've got to do is find an easier way to reskill in new careers, not punish financially people that are out there having a go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Please rise for the benediction and remain standing in the pews. This is taken from Catholic poet John O'Donohue. It's for those who hold power. May the gift of leadership awaken in you as a vocation, keep you mindful of the providence that calls you to serve. As high over the mountains the eagle spreads its wings, may your perspective be larger than the view from the foothills. When the way is flat and dull in times of gray endurance, may your imagination continue to evoke horizons. When thirst burns in times of drought, may you be blessed to find the wells. May you have the wisdom to read time clearly and know when the seed of change will flourish. In your heart, may there be a sanctuary for the stillness where clarity is born. May your work be infused with passion and creativity and have the wisdom to balance compassion and challenge. May your soul find the graciousness to rise above the fester of small mediocrities. May your power never become a shell wherein your heart would silently atrophy. May you welcome your own vulnerability as the ground where healing and truth join. May integrity of soul be your first ideal, the source that will guide and bless your work. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you everyone so much for coming out to Westminster College tonight. Uh, we appreciate it very much and we wish you prosperity, freedom, and fairness in all that you do. Thank you very much. Uh, please remain in the pews until the platform party is exited. Have a safe drive home.